Zeiss Beyond Talks, the podcast, episode number two, Ways of Seeing. For me, photography is a way to help you fall in love with your world in order to want to preserve it, bearing in mind that you won't save what you don't love. Hello and welcome to the second episode of Zeiss Beyond Talks, the podcast. My name is Yasmin Blair, and in this episode, we talk about the creation and importance of earth-shattering images. We discuss how a Zeiss lens became an important witness to the moon landing and how photographs can help us develop a deeper understanding of the beauty and fragility of our home planet. Two experts, Dr. Vladan Blanik, an expert in optical design, and Sebastian Copeland, a polar explorer, climate analyst, and photographer, help us better understand the technical details and the evocative power of those world-changing images. Whether you were alive at the time or not, you have likely seen the iconic images taken during the moon landings of the 1960s and early 1970s. These images were revolutionary. Until then, people had only speculated what the moon's surface might look like, but now they could see it for the very first time from outer space. Most of the photos taken during the space missions had been scheduled ahead of time. But something unexpected happened during the Apollo 8 mission on December 24, 1968. That morning, three astronauts orbited the moon in their spacecraft, photographed the lunar landscape and looked for suitable landing sites for future missions. The mission commander was preparing to turn the spacecraft to a new orientation when he and his two colleagues noticed something unusual. The command module pilot was in the lower equipment bay, observing lunar landmarks. The lunar module pilot was in the right-hand seat. He was looking at the moon through the side window and taking pictures with a Hasselblad still camera fitted with a Zeiss telephoto lens. Another Hasselblad camera with an automatic timer was installed in the commander's window, taking pictures of the moon every 20 seconds. As the spacecraft emerged from the dark side of the moon, the astronauts looked down on the lunar far side, then looked up and noticed the Earth rising above the moon's gray horizon. That was a completely unexpected view. In audio recordings, you can hear the surprise in their voices as the event unfolded and their joy at seeing the Earth from outer space. The command module pilot called out, Oh my God, look at that picture over there. The Earth coming up. Wow, isn't that pretty? Hey, don't take that. I'm scheduled. <laughs> Got a color film, Jim? Hand me a roll of color quick. Oh man, that's color. Great. Where is it? Quick. The astronauts scrambled to find a color film to insert into their camera while the spacecraft remained in position. For a moment, they even thought they might have missed their opportunity. Yet, working together as a team, the astronauts managed to quickly set up the camera, frame the image, and click the release button, taking several images with different exposure times. Yo, I got a frame that's very clear right here. Got it? That is how the NASA astronauts managed to take the very first color photograph of the Earth. The photo depicts a small blue planet floating in the darkness of space, known as Earthrise, it became one of the most frequently reproduced images in the world. It was on the cover of Time magazine and was reproduced on a U.S. postage stamp. Many have said that seeing this photo helped them realize the beauty and fragility of the precious planet that we inhabit. 
One of the astronauts later said that seeing the Earth from the spacecraft made him realize just how small and insignificant humans are. Following the success of Apollo 8, Zeiss was asked to develop a camera lens for the Apollo 11 mission where humans would set foot on the moon for the very first time. The moon landing was going to be an enormous milestone. The astronauts would take photos of the moon both to study its geography and geology and to document their adventure. Zeiss researchers and engineers were responsible for developing photographic lenses that could withstand the special conditions of taking photographs in outer space. But how does one build the appropriate equipment for such a momentous undertaking? Dr. Vladan Blanik is an expert for optical design and has worked at Zeiss for over 20 years now. We have asked him to describe some of the special challenges of developing photographic equipment that could be used on the moon. In the 1960s, NASA used more than a dozen different Zeiss lenses on their space missions. Most of the pictures were taken with Hasselblad medium cameras and their Zeiss lenses. During the early missions, NASA also took some pictures with the Zeiss Contarex camera. Zeiss also had to consider user-friendliness to allow the astronauts to take photos in extremely difficult conditions. The history of the collaboration between NASA, Zeiss and Hasselblad is very interesting. Zeiss and Hasselblad had been cooperating since 1952. However, during the first NASA space missions, neither Hasselblad nor Zeiss knew that their equipment is being used in space missions. The fact that Zeiss lenses were used was thanks to NASA astronaut Walter M. Shearer. He was an enthusiastic Hasselblad photographer himself. In 1962, he bought a Hasselblad camera and a Zeiss lens in a camera store in Houston for his space flight. He took fantastic pictures of the Earth from the orbit. These pictures filled the covers of many newspapers and magazines. Often they appeared in color for the first time ever. It wasn't until 1966 that the companies Hasselblad and Zeiss found out just by chance that NASA has used their equipment. This happened during a spacewalk of astronaut Michael Collins. He accidentally lost his camera in space. So this camera probably still orbits today. Newspapers worldwide were joking about the launch of the first Swedish-German satellite. This is how the Zeiss managers found out that they have been part of NASA's space program for quite some time already. So Zeiss and Hasselblad offered their support to NASA for the development of new lenses for the lunar missions. Building such a device represented an incredible challenge, especially since the scientists had less than one year to complete the task. In this race against the clock, Zeiss scientists and technicians collaborated to develop the so-called moon lens, Zeiss Biogon 5.660. The lens was made resistant to fluctuating temperatures inside and outside the spacecraft. This lens had apertures and focus rings that could be used by the astronauts while wearing the thick gloves of their spacesuits and floating in zero gravity. Since the astronauts were not professional photographers, but engineers and pilots, they had to be specially trained how to operate the camera. They practically had to operate the camera blind since their space helmets prevented them from looking through the visor. The most important design feature of the camera and lens was its ease of use. The usual camera viewfinder was completely re removed, as it cannot be used with the astronaut helmet. Therefore, the astronauts had to practice blind photography, that is estimating the picture framing and the object distance. Operating of the lens with bulky space gloves was enabled with special levers for f-stop, exposure time and focus distance ring. A checklist to choose the right aperture and exposure times was printed on the film magazine. A glass plate printed with a grid of fine crosses was placed directly in front of the film. 
You can see these small reference crosses on every picture taken on the lunar surface. The astronauts took 360 degree panoramic images from several positions of the landing area. Those were stitched together to create an exact topographical map of the entire landing area. When the astronauts took their first step on the moon on July 20th, 1969, more than 500 million people around the world watched the event live on television and were amazed by what they saw. The Biogon 5.660 lens, or moon lens, allowed the astronauts to take extremely clear photos of the moon's surface and return them to Earth where the films were developed. All in all, approximately 30,000 images were taken during the Apollo missions between 1962 and 1972. They have become part of our collective memory and continue to shape our relationship with Earth. Some of the camera lenses that were initially developed for lunar photography were later used in popular culture as well. For example, as part of an earlier Apollo mission, NASA had commissioned Zeiss to develop a special lens that allowed the astronauts to photograph the dark side of the moon. The lens they built, a planar 50mm f0.7, has an extremely fast aperture and can take photos in extremely low light conditions. Zeiss only manufactured 10 of these lenses in total. Zeiss kept one lens, sold six to NASA and three to the American filmmaker Stanley Kubrick. In his 1975 film, Barry Lyndon, Kubrick uses this lens for shooting a nighttime scene in a historical castle only using candlelight rather than artificial light. The high aperture speed of the lens allowed Kubrick to create one of the most unique and beautiful images in modern cinema. The film won the 1976 Oscar for cinematography. As the size of photographic devices has continued to decrease over time, so has the size of their lenses. Today's camera lenses have to be small and light enough to be integrated into a smartphone. Dr. Blanik has been involved in developing smartphone cameras at Zeiss. Those cameras use wide-angle lenses that were also used for lunar photography. Dr. Blanik explains how camera lenses have changed over the past several decades. The development of the Biogon lens type, which played the major role in the space missions of NASA, was one of the greatest achievements in the optical design history of camera lenses. There is no other lens type consisting of spherical lens elements only that comes close to the image performance of the Biogon. The classic Biogon and modern lenses and smartphone cameras have one thing in common. They are extremely compact. The ratio of the Biogon's overall length to the image diagonal is only about 1.5. That's another excellent feature of this lens. However, this is by far exceeded by today's smartphone lenses. Those are even shorter by a factor of two with the same image size. This property is of course essential for the nowadays excellent quality of smartphone cameras. You have this extremely thin smartphone housing, but you can still use relatively large image sensors. The key to achieve this extremely compact designs are highly aspherical lens elements made of plastic. Those tiny plastic lens elements need to be manufactured with extreme precision. Over the past decades, high-resolution photographic lenses have continued to evolve. Professional photographers benefit from these developments, as do individuals of all ages and backgrounds around the world. The quality of camera lenses in ordinary smartphones can enable users to create stunning photos without any professional equipment. Dr. Blanik explains. However, the most important improvement for the photography is due to digitalization. Digital photography has created endless possibilities because the images are immediately available and transferable and can also be modified, combined and processed. 
people can now easily take and share photos digitally, allowing others around the world to enjoy their images. Nature and travel photography in particular have the power to render us aware of the beauty of our planet and of its fragility. The first photos taken of the moon and in outer space had an enormous impact on humans. These unique and historical images have allowed us to relate to the Earth and the moon in new ways and have profoundly shaped our thinking about our place in the universe. Today's imaging technologies allow scientists to better understand our planet, ranging from tiny particles that one can observe under a microscope to large geographic masses like glaciers. Sebastian Copeland is a polar explorer, climate analyst and photographer. He has dedicated his career to documenting the beauty and uniqueness of our planet and has witnessed and documented urgent environmental issues such as the ongoing and ever-growing consequences of climate change. Ever since childhood, Copeland has been fascinated with the power of the image. I, um, I never chose photography. Photography chose me when I was a kid and it became a medium of transmission that was just um, a natural extension of uh, my imaginary and of course, of course what I got to see as well and experience. Copeland started taking nature photos as a child while accompanying his grandfather on photo safaris. In college, Copeland studied political science glaciology and astronomy and considered pursuing a PhD in science. But by the time he graduated from college, he was already becoming a successful commercial photographer in the fashion and music industry. So he pursued a career in advertising and commercial photography for several years. In his 30s, he returned to his first passion, nature photography. He explains that compared to commercial photography... Nature is more about listening, um, accepting, uh, waiting, and being grateful when it, shows, <laughs> when it shows up in the way that you were hoping to see it. That experience is very similar to what the astronauts witnessed when they unexpectedly encountered Earthrise. In more than two decades as a polar explorer, Copeland has managed to take photographs in extreme weather conditions in the North and South Poles. He has been an immediate witness of how glaciers and sea ice have been melting at ever faster rates during the past few years. These experiences have shaped him profoundly, and he has dedicated his career to documenting and addressing climate change. As a climate analyst, he is concerned about the trends he has been observing and spends a lot of time thinking about what humans can do to slow down the destruction of the Earth. Listen, we're just here uh, temporarily, and our responsibility is to bear in mind all the species that are there concurrently and, um, and keeping in mind the future of, of life. Throughout his work, Copeland emphasizes the importance of addressing the challenge of climate change collectively and internationally. More and more, the issue of climate change is confronting us with connectivity uh, globally. In other words, we can't solve this problem individually. We need to solve it collectively. Climate transformation or climate change has no passport. We can't go at it alone and that we can't save ourselves unless we save all of ourselves. Over the course of his career, Copeland has traveled to and photographed some of the most remote and extreme regions in the world. He has had the pleasure and privilege of observing wildlife and stunning geological formations in the Arctic and Antarctic. Those opportunities and experiences have instilled a deep sense of purpose in him. My soul feels a great sense of responsibility uh, 
not in a ostentatious way as I somehow feel like I represent the human kind, uh, but just in terms of recognizing that I could probably make a difference. And so my life's purpose is to effectuate that difference. And I don't necessarily have, you know, the, the, the belief that one action has great consequence. But I do have the conviction that a multitude of small actions have great consequences. Copeland worries that we are running out of time to address pressing issues of climate change and inequality. He stresses the importance of changing our behavior in order to develop a more harmonious relationship with the environment. Copeland points out that change is incremental and that every single one of us can make a difference. It is this perspective that allows him to remain cautiously optimistic. What gives me hope is the infinite capability of human innovation. We live at a very, very exciting time from this state of innovation. Uh, market capitalization uh, for technology-driven solutions represents 38% of the S&P 500. Um, we have the internet on the one hand transformed the way that we communicate and exist. And now we have green tech, which is about to be this fourth industrial revolution, which is going to be transformed not just the way that we live, um, but the, you know, the, the way that we interact, um, the way that we work, and, uh, and all that should give us a lot of hope. Um, solutions are steeped in technology. Seeing images of the Earth's surface taken from outer space or of the vastness of polar landscapes allows us to appreciate the beauty of our natural world. Some of those images have also helped us develop a better understanding of our role in the universe and our responsibility to care for our planet. As Copeland puts it, For me, photography is a way to help you fall in love with your world in order to want to preserve it, bearing in mind that you won't save what you don't love. Thank you for listening to our second episode of Zeiss Beyond Talks, the podcast. We hope that you have enjoyed learning about Zeiss's history, present and future, and about how the work of researchers and photographers can affect how we see ourselves and the planet we call home. Please subscribe, rate and review us and find out more about our anniversary campaign on our website and social channels. You can find the link in the show notes. This was the second episode of Zeiss Beyond Talks, the podcast by the agency Wild Style Network in collaboration with Schönlein Media for the Zeiss Group. Editor, Susanne Unger. Narrator, Jasmin Blair. Executive producer, Felix Vogelstaller. Line producer, Rebecca Emrich. Production manager, Florian Kasten.